series. Uh, in a few moments, uh, we'll introduce tonight's speaker. However, as is the custom, I would like to remind you that next week we have uh, Steve Risting, who's an architect from Indianapolis, who will be ta here talking about some of the work of Ratio Architects, including some of the work that they're doing on the campus. That's what all these cranes and things are over here making all the racket. Uh, I would like to turn the microphone over to uh, Scott Collard, Professor of Landscape Architecture, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Scott. This will not be a long-winded introduction. David has a lot to talk about this evening. Whenever you get a chance to meet somebody like David Camp, you know that you're in for a special treat. Whenever you get to meet somebody who is talking about their passion, uh, you know that you're in for a memorable event. And tonight we're doubly fortunate because David has come here to talk about the two things that he loves the most. One is landscape architecture and the other one is healing. David is the principal of Dirtworks in New York City since 1994. It's an award-winning firm. And the goal of that firm is to advance the effectiveness of gardens in the shaping and influence of healthcare environments. And with that, I will give you David Camp. Well, I'm, uh, first of all, pleased to be here. It's the first time I've been to Ball State and first time I've been to Indiana. And, um, and I've had a marvelous afternoon. Thank you, all my drivers and my crew that picked me up at the airport. And um, what I'd like to talk about tonight, and I would like to, sometimes I'll talk from the microphone, sometimes I'll speak, stiff, um, speak away from the microphone, so I'll try to speak up um, to the folks in the back of the room. But I want to talk a little bit about um, the firm, Dirtworks, um, what brought me to this point? Um, it's a question a couple students asked me today and Scott asked me at dinner tonight. Um, what brought me to working in healthcare? Um, so let me start off by telling you a little bit about Dirtworks. Um, first of all, the name. Um, it's not my name. My name is David Camp. Um, but it's based on a philosophy that dirt works that the idea that gardens can influence and can be an effective measure in the sense of isolation and the sense of vulnerability that one has in illness and crisis. And it's also based on the idea that, that gardens can also be an effective resource for facilities in expanding their ideas of care. Uh, two principles that I feel that the gardens are about are opportunity and flexibility. In a sense, allowing each individual to make their own connection with gardens in their own way, on their own terms, and at their own pace. And then there's flexibility. The things that we need to consider when we're building gardens are that interests change, programs change, therapies change. These sorts of spaces need to be dynamic. They need, in a sense, to offer that ebb and flow that as we begin to understand more and more about our environments and about our healthcare environments, that <clears throat> they offer that kind of flexibility. I started Dirtworks back in 1995. Um, one of the first projects I'll share with you um, was formative in my career in understanding, in a sense, the power that design has on influencing the individual, uh, particularly in a sense the power that design has in instilling a sense of identity. Um, I may actually launch into the slides now. Let's see if I can. Can we turn down the lights just a bit here? <laughs> the project that I started my career with was the design of the new Parliament House building in Canberra, Australia. It was an immense project, uh, about a 10-year construction project, uh, costing about a billion dollars in all. Um, it involved, I would say, close to 3,000 employees for this space. Um, it's built on 80 acres, and it forms what I would call the heart of the, of the continent, the heart of the nation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 
the idea that design can instill a sense of identity. Uh, this project was formative in my career in understanding that here we were designing not only for that individual visitor who had to come to the Parliament House, um, it was designing for, let's say, the Prime Minister. Um, it was designing for a parliamentarian. Um, and yet in the same breath, we were designing for the nation. We were trying to design a building that had an identity, that would provide, in a sense, an identity for an individual visitor as well as an identity for the nation as a whole. I'll try to give you a bit of a background in terms of the scope and scale of the project. Let's see if I can figure this out. <clears throat> Let me ask you all, is that in focus? All right, let me go the other way. All right, great. <clears throat> Canberra itself was part of an international design competition held back at the turn of the century, and the design for the city was uh, won by a fellow by the name of Walter Burley Griffin. Uh, the city itself was laid out on a triangular basis. Um, the government center was here, the defense center was here, excuse me, the city center was here, and the government center was here. The idea being is that the three formed a triangle. Across the triangle was a water axis, was a lake. Bisecting it was a land axis, connecting the war memorial here, the main lookout, which was Mount Ainsley, connecting to a land bridge here of lawn, and then the Parliament House itself. What's important here is that the idea that Parliament was to encompass a complete circle. The building itself was um, actually Parliament House, the, the center circle here, was not built uh, on initially. It was, in a sense, an open hillside. One of the things to remember was that this was built, let's say, in the 1920s. Uh, provisional Parliament was built at this point right here. So two or three generations grew up with the heart of the nation being a landscape, being, in a sense, a land form. One of the things that we tried to identify in this building was a connection of identity, both with the land and as well as with the people. This is a view looking from Mount Ainsley. Here's the war memorial. Here's the, the, the parade grounds, the land access, and then Parliament House beyond. The competition was an international competition with about 350 firms around the world entering. Uh, 349 firms decided to build a building on a hill. Our concept, uh, which was developed by, by um, Aldo Jurgula, was the idea of a building in a hill. So that, in a sense, instead of building upon a hill, we carved the hill away and we put the building inside and recreated the original landform. The idea being is that here an entire country had developed a love and, in a sense, its heart of the, uh, the, the heart of the project was a landform we didn't want to give that away. We wanted, in a sense, the landform to be the dominant element in this landscape. You can begin to see, actually, let's go to the next slide. This is looking down across the parade ground at the provisional house and the new parliament house. The idea being is that by carving away the hill, we covered part of the building with land so that the original topography for the hill retained. This is looking again at the water air axis here. The two houses blend together. The provisional house and the new parliament house are seen as one. But again, the idea of the land form is retained. This is a view, an area view of the project during construction. You begin to get a sense of the scale here, the, the cars and whatever. This is the continuation of the land bridge here, uh, culminating in a forecourt area here. This is the land form that I was telling you about. By carving away the hill, putting in the main public buildings underground, we covered them over with grass so that the idea is that the people can stand over Parliament, that Parliament did not look down upon the people, that again, the landscape itself was the defining element of the house. <clears throat> this is a view of the forecourt area here. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, St. Peter's Square fits neatly inside this space. Um, it's an immense space, and the idea being is that it was trying to capture the big sky that one would have in the deserts, um, the sense of scale one has with, um, with the sky and a very, very simple ground plane. At the center of the forecourt <clears throat> was a pool. In the center of the pool was an island in a sense symbol, you know, symbolizing Australia itself, 
The heart of that, though, if I come to the next slide, um, was an Aboriginal painting. Um, this was actually a, a style of painting called Papunya. We worked with Aboriginal artists from the center part of the, of the, of the continent to develop a system that was actually about 75,000 hand-cut pieces of granite. But the idea being is that the heart of the project, in a sense the heart of the nation, was an Aboriginal culture. That was the draw to the landscape that we wanted to create. That here, in a sense, at the heart of the project was a design symbolizing meeting place. That we wanted within this vastly different scale, uh, this huge scale, that you could begin to see the land bridge across and Mount Ainsley beyond, that within this broad cityscape scale and this national scale, we wanted to bring it down to that individual visitor, that connection both to the landscape as well as to the people, to the Aboriginal people. I found during the course of this project that one of the other elements that I felt very, very strongly about and began to understand is that illness is a defining moment for most individuals in their lives. As this project ended during the eight-year project, during the eight-year construction project, I began to focus more closely on this idea of healing and health care. Um, in 1995, I decided to leave the firm and focus directly on this idea of health care, looking directly at the idea of gardens and nature and the context of illness and crisis. I formed Dirtworks in 95 um, at basically the time that I was also offered a Loeb Fellowship to Harvard. Um, one of the things that the fellowship offered me was a chance to pause in my career. Uh, the, the, the Loeb Fellowship is a mid-career design fellowship designed to allow somebody to come to Harvard, no strings attached, and simply to study. So I spent the year not in the School of Design, but in the School of Public Health. I took classes in ergonomics. I wanted to understand how people walked, how people reached, the sort of shuffle one has when one has a, a sense of an infirmary of the leg, um, how people walk upstairs. I took classes in medical ethics. I wanted to understand the broader sense of healing and the broader sense of health care. And it brought me to my first project, which was a project I started pro bono. Um, This is a project called the Joel Schnapper Memorial Garden, which some of you may be familiar with. It's been published in a, a few pieces. And I'd like to devote most of my talk to this piece um, because it's a learning curve. Uh, it was an immense learning cur curve at the beginning of my career, and it remains a learning curve. It remains a project I draw back upon. And as each of you start your, start your professions, you'll find that there will be certain projects that are very, very important to you that you will draw upon in years to come. To give you a bit of a background, the Joel Schnapper Memorial Garden is built in a uh, long-term health care facility called the uh, uh, Terrence Cardinal Cook Health Care Center. It's a large center built up in the Bronx section of New York, actually Spanish Harlem. Um, there's around 700 individuals. Um, it has, I would say, uh, a large population of elderly, a large population of children with developmental illnesses, and then a large AIDS care population as well. This garden was built to serve an AIDS care population. Um, it, at the time, it was one of the largest gardens, of, largest facilities of its kind in the state, serving HIV. It was also built back in 1995, and it's important to remember that as I walk through the garden and, and share the garden with you, understand where the disease was at that time. Where was HIV? What was the population one was, you know, one was having to deal with? In designing the project, one of the things that I felt was extremely important was this idea of opportunity, allowing an individual to experience the garden at their own pace. One of the things that one has to realize when one is dealing with HIV is that it's an immensely individual illness, is that conditions and infirmities and abilities change daily, that in a sense we needed to develop a way that one can draw into the garden at their own way, at their own pace. This is the view directly at the front door. One of the things I wanted to offer was an individual, lots of opportunities. Here at the door, one has a shady trellis, uh, in a sense, a, a shady room that one can experience. Further into the garden, there's a bench underneath the shade of a dappled uh, of a tree. There's a, um, a tent structure further in that provides a certain amount of protection from sunlight. 
Um, and further in, there's full sunlight. Let's see the next slide, actually. This is an aerial view of the garden. Um, when we started with the space, it's around a 3,000 square foot space, um, I felt the need to create a series of garden rooms. One of the things that we were talking about at dinner was the idea of a progression of protective environments. With HIV and various medications, one needs to be aware of a variety of different conditions. I wanted to offer, in a sense, rooms that were a certain size that a family could gather, should they wish. Um, this room has subsequently been covered over with vines. Um, there are rooms like here with the tents. Um, further into the garden, there's larger spaces. One enters the garden from this end down here. This is the, uh, the large day room. Um, just opposite the door is a smaller space. That, that may be as far as one wishes to go into the garden. Um, but from there, one can, in a sense, experience a variety of different spaces. One of the things that's also important to consider is the view down into the garden. Um, a lot of these individuals um, could not get into the garden. So what is the view one is offering as one is, is looking down into the garden? We want to offer a whole variety of different spaces and, and, and visual uh, cues. Um, one of the things that you'll also see later in the design, uh, as I walk you through it, is this compass. Um, the sense of orientation one has in long-term care uh, is often lost. And a question that came back and again um, so many times during the course of building this garden was, which way is north? I lived north of here. I wanted to find ways that would allow an individual to make, in a sense, a connection, an orientation. This is a view just at the front door. Um, one of the other things that we were talking about at dinner was that threshold, that as one steps outside into a garden space, celebrate that moment. In a sense, that may be the idea of, of, of diminishing strength, that in a sense with stamina and strength changing on a daily basis, make that statement, make that decision to step into the garden a celebration. I wanted to have a bench just outside the door, so if that's all the strength an individual had, it's a moment, it's a celebration, it's a spot to pause. Um, it's a destination unto itself. This is just opposite the front door here. It's hard to tell, uh, but there's a, um, a birch tree here that provides a certain amount of dappled sun. There's a butterfly bush to provide butterflies and bees so that from the door one can see a certain amount of, of, of insect life. Um, one of the wonderful features I love about this bench, it's a, um, a bench called a rain bench. Um, it's a recreation of a bench designed back at the turn of the century by Joseph Hoffman. It's hard to tell from this slide, but the design of the back area here is exactly the same as the base. So that after a rainstorm, a, uh, a staff member can simply come outside, flip the bench upside down, and there's a dry seat. So that just outside, there's a wonderful moment. Um, it's that connection one needs to make to the garden, that the staff, in a sense, wants to celebrate that idea of stepping into the garden, so that by having a dry seat just outside, somebody can enjoy the garden. One of the other things that I mentioned just a second ago was the idea of a progression of protective environments. I wanted to offer denser shade, dapple shade, and sunlight. Again, conditions vary on a daily basis. Some individuals with medications may want to have shade one day and sunlight the other. Offer that opportunity for somebody to choose what's right during a particular day. This is a view looking back towards the door, and there's a number of features that I want to talk about here. Here you can begin again, uh, again uh, the sense of the compass. We built the garden totally with donations and volunteer labor. It took us around 14 months to build the garden, which I consider to be a real godsend, because so much of the design evolved as we got to know the residents. Um, as I mentioned, the idea of the compass actually came from the residents, that the residents would come out while we're building the garden and say, which way is north? It allowed us to, in a sense, finesse the design, to begin to understand what the residents would need over time. One of the other factors that I found was a lot of individuals were hesitant to go out into the garden. They were afraid of losing their way. Um, I struck up a conversation quite some, after some time with several of the female residents. 
when we started the garden, um, I would say most of the population was male. In fact, I would say 98% was male, um, about 50% gay, about 50% um, chemical abusers. By the time the project was completed here, I would say 75% were female. And I would say the majority were homeless or chemical abusers. So within two years' time, the second wave of HIV had happened. So the garden had to have that kind of flexibility. It had to, in a sense, accommodate a very, very different type of patient, a very, very different type of resident. But during the course of the project, I struck up a conversation with one of the female residents who um, didn't have a garden. Her parents didn't have a garden, but her grandparents had a garden. So here we were making a connection two generations back. And she said she used to sweep leaves into a path. And all of a sudden, I came up with the idea, why not create a path from the door that led out of the garden, around the compass, and actually pointed someone back towards the door. So that in a sense, there was a path. So someone who was slightly hesitant to go into the garden would have something to follow. That in a sense, they could follow around the compass, which gave them a sense of orientation, and then it led them back towards the door. By following around the compass, one gets a complete view of the garden as well. So one could choose to go further into the garden or choose to go back inside. We developed the path as a series of stencils, this being a stencil of leaves used in the garden. Um, I actually created this while I was on jury duty and um, took various leaves from the garden. And um, in New York City, the, the jury duty used to be in these humongous rooms. And there was large tables that you would sit at and read the newspaper or whatever. And I spread out the leaves, and I created this wonderful sort of stencil. I subsequently developed the stencil, and it's now been used in the art therapy program. Um, it's been used now to create a letterhead for the garden. Um, it's, uh, it's created for posters so that events in the garden are now using this idea of the stencil. That something in the garden now has been used by the other therapy programs as well. But it, here is that way of drawing somebody into the garden and then leading somebody back towards the door. This garden room that I mentioned before um, is large enough for a family to gather at. In the case of, of, of this particular facility, you'll often find extended families would come and visit. So I wanted to create spaces that a family could gather with a certain amount of privacy, and people could come and go without feeling like they're intruding. As I mentioned, we built this garden with very, very little money, all with donations. Um, and so I tried to create things that we could simply do using paint. And here I created a grid on the floor. There's large benches so that families could gather together. And the staff always leaves a little box of chalk here. So a grid on the floor and a box of chalk, and kids are going to always find something to do. So it becomes a living room floor. But here was a very, very inexpensive way of creating a smaller area within the garden that would allow a family a certain amount of, of, of privacy. I also used lattice columns here, to which could begin to frame views. I also felt it was important to always see that door. At the door, there's an emergency call button so that somebody inside the garden always has that sense of security of knowing where the door is, or if there's an emergency, always knowing where to go. That sense of, of vulnerability is, is, is immensely strong in these sorts of situations. So you always need to accommodate that and sort of anticipate that need. This is a closer view. You can begin to get a sense of the stencil here. Um, The stencil lasted about five years, and uh, which would, would be about right. Um, we're now going back in and painting it again. But what I'm asking um, that the, in fact, we found some volunteer artists who want to come back in and, and recreate this stencil, is I don't want them to follow the exact pattern of the existing stencil. These leaves have now weathered a bit. And what I would like for them to do is to take this stencil and now start to soften the edges so that the second stencil would begin to create, in a sense, a layering of leaves, just as one would have in a forest, that leaves follow over various seasons. This idea of the stencil path, within, let's say, 10 years, this path is going to be quite wide. Some of the leaves are going to be very faint. Some are going to be very, very strong. But the idea of building a sequence of time into the garden I thought was important, even to the point of using that for the stencil. At the center of the garden is also a bright color. Visual acuity is, is often an issue with, with individuals with HIV. So I wanted a bright, strong color that would be a landmark, that elsewhere in the garden, one can always see this. And from here, one can always get inside to the, um, to the nurse's station. <laughs> 
This is a closer view over time. This, um, the previous shot was taken about three years ago. This was taken about two years ago. Um, you can begin to see, in fact, let me go back for a second and talk. In fact, I'm going to go back two slides. The lattice columns that we created um, do two things. These are resonant rooms that look out into the garden. I wanted the lattice columns to provide, in a sense, a space for vines to provide a certain amount of summer shade that would let winter sun in as well. They also provided a certain amount of privacy so that people that came and go, you know, that came in and, and went through the, through, the, through the garden space here would not be looking directly into the windows of the residents, that this provided a certain amount of privacy. Um, one of the things I also wanted was I wanted space inside the lattice columns that somebody inside could hang their plants just outside the window that maybe they could not get out that day or they're having a problem. They could see their handiwork just outside their windows. This is the same area and you can see we've used two varieties of clematis and I think there may be a moonflower or something else here. But the area in between has been filled in. And this has been done by the residents themselves. Um, one of the things that I felt was extremely important was the idea of ownership. That this was a garden for individuals who, in a sense, may have come from a whole range of, of different backgrounds. Maybe they didn't have the safety net of home or community. But I wanted the garden to be a place that they, in a sense, could own, that they would maintain, they would retain ownership. And the residents have started to grow things. This particular resident inside here has taken over this whole outside area, and she's created a promenade so that as one comes from the front door here, she's sharing her garden with somebody else. That sense of ownership and that sense of sharing for this group of individuals I thought was a major point, and, and the garden helped facilitate that idea. One of the other things that was very important was bringing the staff in. The facility hired a horticultural therapist as the garden developed, again, to help create that connection for the residents themselves. This therapist now works with the residents. They collect seeds from the year before so that for planting in the following years. Uh, she encourages the residents to take care of the plants. But she's become that great connection between the actual garden and the residents themselves. One of the other areas we created was totally protected by tents. That sunlight can often be a problem with certain medications. And this was an area that you could have a therapy program going on, while the rest of the garden could be enjoyed by other individuals. We used lattice screens to screen off the remaining portion of the rooftop, which had a variety of mechanical equipment and, um, and a sundry support facilities for the rest of the, uh, of the uh, facility here. But the lattice screens themselves became display places. Um, these lattice screens are used for photo displays, for art and craft exhibits. Um, very, very simple ways of creating areas and opportunities for other staff and other therapy programs to use. The back end of the garden is an area that co that's called the farm. Um, it was an area that we wanted to encourage the residents to grow whatever they wanted to. Uh, one of the things that I found instrumental in when I started looking at these sorts of gardens was realizing that each of us reach in a different manner. Uh, the classes I took in ergonomics, uh, the research I did with uh, a horticultural therapist named Nancy Chambers in New York realized that each of us sits in a wheelchair differently. Each of us had different reaching strengths and reaching gates. Uh, we're sitting at different heights. I wanted to create an area of the garden that allowed an individual to find what was comfortable for them. So all the planners vary in height. And it allows an individual to find that level of comfort in, the, in, a, in a planting bed. Some people like to plant while they're standing up, others sitting down. Um, it allowed each individual to find that connection. This area of the garden changes every year. Uh, we have dwarf apple trees and a certain number of herbs that are sort of planted on a permanent basis, but otherwise the residents grow what they want. One of the things that I realized that as the garden was being developed was the sense of isolation this particular wing had in the facility. Uh, here at, at Terrence Cardinal Cook, it wasn't called the AIDS care wing, it was called the discrete unit. They had even separated the sort of illness that it was. There was a huge gulf in this facility um, with where this particular wing was. 
uh, that in a sense no one else in the facility would ever come to the AIDS care wing unless they had a specific duty to do there. Once the garden was developed, all of a sudden staff began to visit. Um, administration began to hold meetings there. Staff would hold meetings there. All of a sudden, there's a flower arranging class for the elderly developed there. And I realized that this garden created a huge bridge between the AIDS care facility and the rest of the facility. Um, it's almost like a pebble in a pond that this garden all of a sudden began to be used by all these other departments. Um, they're holding fundraisers there. This garden has spawned the development of other rooftop spaces. There's a, um, a garden lecture series now that the facility holds. That this simple garden has now permeated through the facility and it's brought staff members in to, to see what's growing, to see how the tomatoes are doing, who's growing broccoli this year. Um, it's been a wonderful common denominator and it's this idea of nature. Um, that nature in a sense is, is um, the word I'm looking for is non-judgmental. In a sense, um, an individual in care um, can all of a sudden be a caregiver. Um, that's the wonderful quality a garden like this can provide. But here a couple of residents are checking on some of the vegetables. This is Wendell. He's a, a became a wonderful gardener here in the garden. Um, in fact, I think we have a couple of pictures of Wendell. This is Wendell um, in his little section uh, growing here. Uh, Wendell had never gardened before, and here he is growing broccoli, all the sorts of wonderful things. It sort of opened up a whole other world for him. Wendell likes to grow um, and, and plant facing vertically, or facing directly in front of the planter here. One of the things that I designed into the planter was very, very wide rails. At the far end of the garden, I wanted a space that if in, an individual was tired or all of a sudden needed to sit down quickly, these were wide enough that someone could just sit if all they needed was just a moment's rest. I also found, which I didn't realize, um, kids would love to climb on this and run down the length of these planters. So I added supports underneath here. And that's part of that learning curve. Things that I didn't anticipate happening, they happen. So you build that into the garden. Part of the farm also has lower planters here. Uh, again, you know, we built this garden on a shoestring. Um, these are just good old Agway planters here. Uh, they're just tubs. We set them on um, a wheel bases with locking wheels so that they can be rolled out of the way for larger events. But these tubs are lower than the other planters. Again, offering somebody a different height to plant. But also two or three individuals could plant together around a, around a tub. Or, in a sense, a, a therapist could have a demonstration going on with one of the other planters. So that these, in a sense, became a little bit more social than what's happening over here. And also at the far end of the garden, um, I wanted to use water. Um, you'll often hear a lot of debate about the use of water in gardens. Um, certain dribbling sounds triggers the need to urinate. Um, and at the far end of the garden, um, to, to have that urge and have the bathroom at the, you know, at the opposite end inside the facility, well, the bathroom might as well be a, a bus stop away. Um, it's a real problem. But I decided to develop uh, the idea of using water, um, but not with a dribbling sound, but with a sheeting sound. And I worked with the therapist on this, and we used basically just a horse trough uh, from Agway, a recirculating pump, uh, a large watering can, and I added additional holes so that the sound was sheeting. Um, a small amount of water here goes a long ways. Um, this amount of water screens an activity over here from a more private area off to the side here. Um, it's also a spot that someone can wash their hands, that somebody who's gardening, in a sense, could simply come up and wash their hands, which is a, a quite a delightful feeling. Here's just a close-up area here. It's hard to tell, and I don't think I have a slide of it, but right above here are some wooden wind chimes. Um, I also tried to look at the idea of sound as one progresses through the garden. Um, being a rooftop, there were air conditioning units, there were fan units, a lot of different noises that we had to uh, accommodate. Um, I worked with a husband and artist, a husband and wife artist team um, called Bill and Mary Buchan on the idea of developing a sound garden that in a sense, as one progresses through the garden, sounds changed. At the front entry, we used a variety of metal wind chimes, which would help compete with the, uh, uh, with the TV that was blaring just inside the day room. But as one progresses through the garden, 
the sounds change. So here at the far end of the garden, the most meditative end of the garden, was the sound of water and wooden chimes. Here's a window planting again in another area of the garden. Uh, right next to the, the water fountain here uh, was a quiet area. It's an area that I wanted to develop that a therapist could work one-on-one -on -one with an individual. These are, in a sense, designed almost like library carols. Let's hit the next photo. Uh, where you can begin to get a sense that it's a space that a, ther you know, that a therapist could work one-on-one -on -one with an individual, or a therapist could be by themselves, or an individual can plant something by themselves. Um, the actual carol is covered with, um, with a, a variety of vines as well to provide a certain amount of shade. Um, it's a spot that I didn't realize um, the, the residents started using as their own plant hospital. So here was this idea of the person in care becoming a caregiver. Uh, plants that, in a sense, were uh, uh, in need of care uh, were brought here so that there was a more protective spot for, uh, uh, for nurturing plants. This is just a close-up. This slide um, sums up a lot of what the garden is about. It's one of the lattice columns, uh, this idea of opportunity, this idea of flexibility, and this idea of ownership. Um, here was a lattice column that's been adopted by one of the residents. Um, it's a spot that, in a sense, I wanted to have in a sense where people could display their own crafts, their own plants. Um, that sense of ownership that one could be build into the garden I think was very, very important. The next garden I want to talk about is a garden that we just finished up. Um, it's a garden we did for the uh, Channel Gardens at Rockefeller Center. Uh, an immensely different scale, an immensely different idea of well-being and, and healing. Um, but I was approached by Rockefeller Center to look at this idea of the Channel Gardens. Um, if you're familiar with Rockefeller Center, uh, let me see if the next slide. The skating rink for the center is here. Uh, the Channel Gardens connect the skating rink with Fifth Avenue here. But our idea for looking at this, uh, this idea of a series of smaller gardens for the Channel Gardens was to take this idea of well-being and this idea of healing and restorative landscapes to a very, very different scale of project. Um, here was a very public space. Um, you had tourists. You had, in a sense, you know, um, people on cell phones making phone calls. You had busy office workers coming back and forth. But how can one begin to look at the scale of Rockefeller Center um, and the scale of the buildings and the materials of the building and begin to bring that scale back down to the individual? One of the things that I, I think is an interesting parallel is the work at Canberra was so much about the individual scale and the large scale. Here we were designing for that individual visitor as well as for the city, as well as for the nation. At Rockefeller Center, in a sense, we had that same difference of scales. We were designing for that individual resident to enjoy the garden. Um, we were also trying to put the gardens into context of Rockefeller Center and Rockefeller Center within the context of the city itself. But Rockefeller has a series of smaller pools that we began to create a series of garden nooks um, along the, the garden here. If I go back a slide. One of the things I was looking at here was a very, very simple palette of materials. I wanted to work with grasses, um, something that was very, very unusual for a cityscape, but it provided a, a wonderful sense of scale. Uh, the color of the grasses, working with the limestone of the building, the idea that the grasses themselves formed a veil that, in a sense, provided a certain amount of privacy, but one that you could also look through as well. Grasses of different textures, like the juncus that we used inside the water, um, begins to frame the view down to Prometheus here. So that the idea being is that the scale of the grasses begins to work with the scale of the architecture itself. Here you can see the juncus beginning to frame the uh, uh, facade and the, the, the various sculptures. We also worked with crepe myrtles. Um, I wanted a sense of canopy inside there and wanted to look at the idea of, of color and various textures. Uh, the garden has at its center a large square of daisy-like chrysanthemums. I planted them 
in slightly tight blooms. The idea being is that over the course of this um, exhibit, which ran for several weeks, the blossoms would open so that somebody, in a sense, who comes there on a daily basis would see a change. But beginning to look at the idea of the scale of the grasses, the color of the, uh, of the crepe myrtles, the idea of tentative blooms beyond. Here you can get a, a sense of the, the sea of daisies looking back towards Saks Fifth Avenue. And a great shot looking down into the garden here. This is a view early in the morning. And again, the crepe myrtles framing the view of Prometheus, but creating smaller spaces within this large public space. A great view as the sunlight comes over the buildings here. One of the wonderful things about the grasses as well is that within this static environment, it caught the slightest breeze so that somebody who was sitting there would just catch a little bit of a shimmer of the, of the, of the grasses. A uh, sunlight that would, in a sense, that as the sunlight passed through and between the buildings, there would be shafts of sunlight that would highlight some of the grasses and not others. Uh, very ephemeral qualities that uh, provided, in a sense, a moment's pause. Uh, this, I think, sums up so much of what the garden is about here. Uh, just creating a smaller area within the busy cityscape, um, within midtown Manhattan, just a great small little place to just pause and be. And I think that's it. I'd like to turn it over to questions if I can. One of the things that I brought along with me um, are a series of project sheets, which I would like for y'all to have, that talks into a little bit more depth about the sort of projects, um, some of the design considerations we had, as well as photographs. Okay. Hey, sure. Uh huh. It is. One of the things we were talking about, ident about at, at dinner is this idea of identity, of connection. Uh, we wanted, particularly in the AIDS care facility, uh, we wanted to use a basic palette of plants um, using, in a sense, things like fragrance as a wayfinding technique that just at the front door uh, there was wisteria so that, in a sense, at a particular time of year, um, uh, there would be a strong sense of fragrance there. Parts of the gardens had no fragrance. So we wanted to use, we wanted to use this issue of fragrance very, very carefully. Um, fragrance can induce nausea for some individuals. So we tried to look carefully at various qualities of plants, uh, using the idea of sound um, at one end of the garden, using grasses so that that sound of grasses would be one element. Um, but one of the things we also wanted was to encourage the idea of planting over time, that the residents would plant things that mean something to them. Um, you'll find that parts of the garden have kale. Um, certain residents, you know, have grown up with a particular, you know, from the south, and they would like to grow things that, you know, in a sense would remind them. Um, so we've tried to use plants very, very carefully, and it's providing this base palette of plant materials, but otherwise the plants change over time. Uh, more than anything, I wanted to create rooms um, allowing those rooms to change um, as the residents' needs, as the residents' interests changed over time, as therapy programs changed over time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I worked with, and that's why I think the idea of bringing in like a horticultural therapist on board was immensely important in this particular project. Um, because you'll find bringing the staff in and allowing the staff to have that interaction, you know, that interaction with the residents uh, allowed us to begin to fine tune the garden. Um, that area of, of promenade where that one resident had grown all those sorts of uh, a variety of plants, just beyond there is an herb garden. 
and the, the staff therapist has now, in a sense, begun to identify certain plants, providing a certain amount of information about the history of plants, about the history of certain herbs. One of the other things that that provides is a conversation point. I mean, you're walking around with somebody and you don't know what to say, you know, and you're struck for things to talk about. Well, providing those little moments of, of things that could, oh, look, here's something, you know, I didn't know this. Um, those little gestures allowing, in a sense, conversation pieces were important. It's an education as well, uh, learning more about herbs. Um, the herbs have been a big success there, being a population of a, a large population of chemical abusers. Um, they'll often go out and their morning constitution is sticking their head in a rosemary bush and shaking it and sort of getting a great whiff. Well, you know, it's a great high, you know. They still need that, but they can provide that through herbs. Um, so in a sense, that's a great transition, you know. No bones about it. These are residents who have come from very, very rough backgrounds. You know, it's not like this garden is going to transform them overnight. The garden can still make that bridge and help, in a sense, bring somebody down a path. Um, I often try to bring in that element of education into the garden, um, either identifying the plants or providing that element of, of, of history. Um, it's a great context. Um, I often try to draw in the vernacular for a particular area. We were talking about, um, in a sense, trying to draw things that the community would identify with. If you're designing for a community um, hospital, how do you draw the landscape vernacular into a particular garden that allows residents from the area to identify with that garden? And subsequently, how do you can begin to create things like of history, things of history of the neighborhood, things of history of the community, of the region. You can draw those into the garden as well as sort of great sort of, you know, ways to sort of anchor a garden into an existing you know, landscape, so to speak. Uh-huh. I think it's a little bit of, I, I, one of the things that I think is important is, first of all, the overall garden should have a certain amount of structure, and that you'll often find um, has very little connection to an actual vernacular landscape. One of the things that I try to do is then break it down into a smaller scale so that an individual area of the garden, let's say one of those, and I'll use the term, you know, garden rooms, may have a particular theme attached to it. It's, again, it's, an, it's, it's a way of establishing a certain identity for a particular part of the garden. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll try to oh, I'll either talk louder or into here. Um, but I think dr bringing it down in scale, um, allowing a particular area of the garden to have a certain quality, a certain theme, also allows you a broader chance of, of drawing upon a, a greater population. Um, you may find it, some individuals, um, let's say in the case of, of brain and spinal trauma centers, um, you have to be very careful about the amount of sim uh, sensory stimulation one offers. You may offer parts of the garden that have a lot of stimulation, color and movement and fragrance, other areas that are very, very simple, um, so that you can use the vernacular as a way of still making connections through various parts of the garden and yet still offering a variety of spaces for a variety of needs. Any other questions? 